Welcome to the Pivot Point Podcast. This season, I'm focused on sharing stories and ideas from experts on diversity and inclusion. In this episode, I will share some insights and ideas from my guest expert, Karen Catlin. Together, we will leave you with some actionable tips to think about and discuss with your organization. We share this information because inclusive leadership is a journey. It requires bravery and courage, and you do not have to do it alone. At Pivot Point, I believe we are stronger together we are one. So let's introduce this week's guest. We have with us Karen Catlin. And after spending 25 years building software products and serving as vice president of engineering at Adobe, Karen witnessed a sharp decline in the number of women working in tech, frustrated but galvanized. She knew it was time to switch gears. Today, Karen is a vocal advocate for inclusion, a leadership coach, a keynote speaker, and the author of Better Allies, Everyday Actions to Create Inclusive, Engaging Workplaces, and the Better Allies Approach to Hiring, which is coming soon. So we're going to dig into all that and learn about Karen. Karen, welcome. We're so excited to have you. Oh, Julie, thank you for having me on the podcast. It's always a pleasure to talk with you. And I'm glad we get to spend some time right now together. This is great. Yes, I know. We can, we can always talk for hours and uh, it'll be fun to, to focus on some key points today. I know one that our listeners are always interested in is the backstory. You know, how did you get into this being you know, a VP of engineering in a male-dominated space and witnessing this decline is certainly a catalyst for your work. Tell mm-hmm. us, how did you get Better Allies started. Tell us about the journey. I know. So a little bit uh, more between the point of being a VP of engineering and starting Better Allies. I actually did a pivot myself, speaking of pivot points, and I decided that after spending all that time working in tech, I really wanted to help women working in tech in you know, whatever company they were working in, whatever their job was, I wanted to help them grow their careers and be successful, even though tech is super male dominated, as we know. And so I, about eight years ago, I started my own leadership coaching business. Um, And my business, and I still, that's my prime business today, is um, coaching women to be stronger leaders, to really grow their leadership skills, and basically to stay in tech if that's where they want to be. Um, But after Julie, after doing this for just like a a little bit of time, maybe a year or two, I realized I had a problem. And the problem was that even if I were like the best leadership coach on the planet, which I am not, I'm working towards, I admit that. But even if I were, and I was like just amazing at helping my clients grow their careers, they were still facing this uphill battle. They were facing this challenge because all of their companies just got maler and paler the closer you got to the (laughs) C-suite, frankly speaking. And with all due respect to the male and pale who are listening, um, you know, that's just what the numbers reveal. That's, that's the, that's the facts. So I decided, you know, I can be a great leadership coach and help my clients that way, but I need to do more. And the more work that I wanted to do was to create more inclusive workplaces. So I decided, and this goes back a little over five years ago now, I decided like I was going to create more inclusion across tech, like all by myself. And of course, the first thing anyone does these days when they need to like change the world is step one is create a Twitter handle, right? So I I created a Twitter handle called at Better Allies. It was um, five years ago, just over five years ago now. And my goal was really just to start raising awareness about the challenges that not just women, but people from all sorts of underrepresented groups were facing in workplaces. And what were the simple everyday actions anyone could take to mitigate those challenges, to make it better, to make it more inclusive? And Really, I wasn't sure where this was all going to go. I just was like, I have to get the word out. I have to raise awareness. I have to share these everyday actions. And so I started tweeting. Um, And then over time, people started finding the Twitter account. They would tag friends and colleagues and say, you have to follow this. This account's got great content. People started sending me information to tweet, like, have you seen this going on Mm -hmm. or this idea, this research? And the Twitter handle, it grew and it got more popular. And then, Julie, I have to tell you, I then started getting speaking engagements because of the Twitter account. But they were 
I was anonymous on Twitter. Mm -hmm. I did not associate my name with Better Allies at all. And I um, would get direct messages into Better Allies saying, hey, does anyone at your initiative do any public speaking? (laughs) And you know what I was thinking when I got something like that? Like, yeah, my initiative, it's just me tweeting every now and then about (laughs) these things. Um, But because I wanted to stay anonymous, I would be a little deceptive and write back to the person and say, um, hey, yes, one of our contributors does do some public speaking. We will put you in touch with her. And then I'd go over to my personal Twitter account and uh, send them a direct message and say, hey, I'm Karen Catlin. I contribute to Better Allies and I love public speaking. What do you have in mind? Mm -hmm. So I started getting speaking engagements and sharing this approach, which seemed like it was just novel and helpful, this approach of there are simple everyday actions anyone can take. I started speaking about it. And then I I really think every single talk I gave, someone in the audience during the Q&A would ask, hey, Karen, do you have a book? Because I want more of this. (laughs) And I didn't have a book for a long time, but I finally did write my book, Better Allies, Everyday Actions to Create Inclusive, Engaging Workplaces. And I published that in January 2020, excuse me, January 2019, (laughs) ahead of myself, January 2019. Um, And since then, I have had the best year just like going out and speaking about this approach, teaching workshops, doing keynotes, speaking at company events. Um, And oh my gosh, there's such an appetite for, I, you know, the mindset is I'm a decent human being. I just don't know what to do all the time. So help me out here. Um, Good intention yeah, people, so, right? But they still like, I, there's so much fear in this conversation of saying you're doing the wrong thing. And that fear is understandable because I know I make mistakes all the time, even though I spend so much of my like time and mental energy thinking about being inclusive and doing the right thing, I still make mistakes. And so I can only imagine that for people who aren't spending as much time as I am sort of soaking in this content, that it can be intimidating and and a little anxiety producing. Well, what I love about your story is you followed the market need, right? You Mm. started something out of it. It was a passion project and you listened to your followers and what tools they needed. Um, What's really fantastic about Better Allies, the book, which is a fabulous read, and it truly does live up to its subtitle of everyday actions you can take to be inclusive. And it's the small things often that matter the most um, to those that are underrepresented. And you followed, you're continuing to follow the market need. I know some of your new work on hiring that we'll get into later Mm -hmm. in the episode. Um, But that really is, you know, the, the, entrepreneurial dream is to get to do the work you're passionate about and people also want it. You know, I remember when I found your Twitter handle a couple, oh my gosh, it's almost been three years ago. Mm -hmm. And I assumed you were a man. (laughs) (laughs) Um, You and other people too, because I was writing in this first person voice that made it sound like I was a male, um, I don't know, engineer or leader Mm -hmm. in working in tech. Yeah. So it was a little deceptive. I'm sorry about that. But it was, there was power in me having that Yep. That online persona of right. a man. Well, what would a man do? Exactly. And it was it was not, you didn't misrepresent yourself. There was an assumption that I made, mm-hmm. right? And um, I know when we connected, we were still anonymous and waiting to kind of publicly reveal. Mm-hmm. What was that like when you publicly revealed you were the one um, managing that Twitter? Did, yeah. How did people respond? I did not make a big deal about it, but I did decide to own that I was behind that handle when I wrote my book. Like there was no way I was Mm going to spend all that time writing my book and not have, not be able to claim what I had done. Um, Writing a book, as you know so well, because you've done this a few times too, writing books, a lot of work. And I think we should um, own up that we are the authors. So I wanted to make sure my book was attributed to me. And as part of that process, it just I just wrote about starting better allies in the book. And at at some point on the online, like profiles started saying, you know, better allies is curated by Karen Catlin. So Uh it it was sort of a soft launch. So, um, yeah. (laughs) Well, and and I think your message is so, um, per, you know, permeant that people really respond to. And I think it speaks to, we need all voices included in this conversation. Um, so I'm curious, Karen, you've been out there speaking, you know, leading these conversations inside organizations and at conferences. What do you hear? What kind of, give us a window into your world. What stories do you hear from leaders that 
you'll want to be analyzed, but maybe, you know, are struggling a little bit. What are, what are some, um, aha moments you've, you've been, uh, you've yeah. witnessed along the way? Yeah. And I f- feel that, so first of all, these happen every time, um, that I talk to someone, whether it's one-on-one or giving a talk and leading a workshop, whatever, they happen all the time. And it's so exciting. And I want to emphasize too, that when I speak, I'm covering a lot of different ideas, a lot of ground. And all I ask is that people pick up maybe one or two things that they're going to try to do differently. They don't have to do it all. And so what resonates with one person is going to be different than what resonates with someone else, for example. But I was leading a workshop just last week and it came up that just this whole thing around this bias that people have that women and women employees are not going to be able to travel if they have young children at home. The bias, it was a healthy discussion. We were talking about this bias, Mm -hmm. where it comes from. And one man said, well, is it really bad if I tell like an internal candidate who's thinking about taking an overseas role? Is it bad if I tell her like this comes with a lot of travel? I really want to make sure you know what you're getting into. I said, no, it's not bad. But do you also say that to the men who are considering these overseas assignments? And he said, yeah, I say, I, I do actually say it to, to them. I said, excellent. That's a great ally movie move, excuse me, ally move. And to just, <laughs> to just ratchet it up one level, make it even more powerful. The next time you have one of those conversations, emphasize whether you're talking to any gender, emphasize, you know, I ask everyone this question when they're considering an overseas assignment. Mm. Do you know about all the travel, blah, blah, blah. And the reason I say to do that is then if it is a woman who is on the receiving end of that, she is not going to be second guessing you and saying, he's only asking that because I do have young kids. Mm-hmm. And getting in That's her a- head that she's different and needs to have additional support or scrutiny right. or whatever it might be. Yep, the maternal wall gender bias is mm-hmm. is very real and in often is cited for the pay gap still existing and is the biggest form of bias um, traditionally towards women. And what you demonstrated so beautifully is someone we both follow, Kristen Pressner's flip it to test it model. Yes. yes. A beautiful ally trick. Yeah, flip it. And if, if you're doing the same across other genders, across other diversity dimensions, then it's probably fair. But it's it's not to your point. Um, stating your intentions up front to make sure it doesn't get mislabeled as bias is important. Right. Right. Exactly. Well, and, and Karen too, I know we're, as we're starting 2020 and I'm calling 2020 the year of the ally selfishly, I'm, I'm really hoping it is. Um, and, and there's I'll, so many indicators. I, I support you with that. I, I'm there. <laughs> 2020 is for the ally. Okay. Well, and, and there's so many indicators. I know you're hearing from companies that allyship, allies is one of our top strategic priorities. Not, it's not just DNI, diversity and inclusion, belonging, all those factors. We're actually focused specifically on engaging allies. And I'm seeing, you know, some of my, in my old book, um, one about how male allies, um, you know, support women for gender equality is a book of a year at a couple companies. And I'm thinking, oh, this is kind of old news, but apparently not. <laughs> Apparently not. Well, congratulations on that. No, you know what? I mean, we we are both thought leaders. I'll just claim that. And thought leaders, we are a step ahead of a lot of the conversations. And mm-hmm. so we spend a lot of time thinking about these things, these um, opportunities to be better allies, these opportunities to lead like an ally, these um, cautionary tales of people doing it wrong or going sideways a little bit. We hear about these all the time, but they aren't necessarily forefront for everybody. Mm-hmm. And, um, and some of the little things, like I feel like I've been talking, I know you have as well about like, um, we should say no to the mantle, the all male panel, right? We shouldn't have that on stage anymore. In fact, it looks a little weird to me now when I see a photo of like all white men on stage speaking about some topic. But so the best practice, excuse me, the best practice here is for an ally to say no to an all majority panel, you know, whether it's all men and you're a man being invited or if it's all white and I'm, I'm white and, you know, if I'm invited to an all white panel, I should say no. Um, but, oh my gosh, this is still a novel thing. And so many people aren't thinking that way at all. And I understand that, but it's a great, it's great when people like us can help keep raising awareness that this is important. It makes a difference. It is more inclusive. It is going to open the, for example, in this example, um, open the stage up for an underrepresented person to be on stage with all of that majority and sharing their expertise and rocking their career. You know, it's just like, we need to have that room. Um, And it's a great ally move. So 
anyway, we are a step ahead, and I think it is important that we keep pushing the word out and getting the word yeah. out about how to be allies. Well, what else do you see in your, your crystal ball? If you had a magic wand and you got to paint a picture of 2020 as we're embarking into 2020, you know, what trends, what, what, what if things are you hearing from your clients that they are focused on, those that are getting diversity and inclusion right? What can our listeners glean from them? Um, well, definitely a lot in the hiring process. And, I, I, you know, I want to talk about this. Um, mm-hmm. So maybe I'll just, I'll tuck that aside for a second because I do want to come back to that. Um, another thing is that more and more, and I don't think it's just tech, but definitely is tech. You know, I, I live in Silicon Valley, so this is sort of my bubble that I live in. But so many companies now are using their product and their voice in the market to stand up for, for more inclusion. Um, an example, I just read an hour ago in Gizmodo, I believe it was, that Airbnb has just removed the accounts of 60 white supremacists from their platform. 60 white supremacists whose names they got off of the dark web because someone leaked. um, There was, there was some white supremacist website that someone figured out who were on that website, the membership, and they leaked the names and Airbnb took that information and cross-referenced it with their own guest list, basically, the people who have accounts to be guests at Airbnb places. And they have, um, they've removed all those accounts because they don't believe that people with um, such, um, so stated so eloquently in the, in the article, but Mm -hmm. such um, uh, extremist approaches to, um, you know, to which race is the right, right race, you know, the only race, they don't believe there's, there should be room on their platform for those, those people. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's one example where tech companies and other companies have an opportunity to really walk the walk, not just talk the talk around inclusion. And that is, it is um, in some ways exciting and in some ways scary for me because such power exists in, um, in, blocking certain people from platforms, from access to things. Um, it has to be wielded with um, a very careful touch. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you are so good at following the news and dispelling those five mm-hmm. key ally actions every <sighs> week. Um, we'll definitely link to your newsletter. It is fantastic. You know, there's a few newsletters that I actually read every <laughs> single week and yours is one. And I, I've been reading that, um, actively for over a year and it's fantastic content because if I miss something in the news, I know Karen's caught it. I know she's tweeted <laughs> about it and aggregated it in a scannable way that spent, it takes no more than a few minutes a week to stay on trend with some of these ally hot topics. So thank you so much, Julie. Oh my I gosh. appreciate it. it. It's great curated content. So yeah, I think companies using their voices, you know, um, here in central Indiana where Salesforce is, is also as well mm-hmm. as in your community, you know, it's a great example I cite a lot of times of a CEO that's really outspoken and actually speaking up, it's not outspoken, it's he's speaking up using his voice and his power and privilege to educate people about gender equality and really um, very firm stance in the DNI component. And so I think looking to more of these companies that can leverage their voice and you know, if you're a company that's not there yet, I mean, simply asking the question inside the organization of, hey, what do our customers look like? What, what do we want our customers to look like in the experiences? Because diversity goes beyond visible characteristics. Mm-hmm. But think about how are we mirroring our customers? If we're, we don't look at like them at all parts of our organization reflect the experiences that our customers have experienced, we're going to be out of sync. We're going to be outdated. There's no way we're going to be able to keep up with market trends if we're not reflected of our customers inside our organization as well. Yes, definitely. And there's also an element of belonging. Um, Not just having the representation and having employees from underrepresented backgrounds and having great diversity in your workforce, but making sure that they all feel they belong, Mm -hmm. that they can thrive and that they can do their best work. This is being pointed to as forget about like the foosball tables and the free food. Mm -hmm. If you want to have a profitable, successful, high growth company, you need to focus on belonging and making sure every employee feels that they can thrive in your environment. Um, yeah, so this is another big topic coming up. Yeah, the belonging factor. I mean, mm-hmm. it goes back to 1942 Maslow's hierarchy. I mean, it's been around for a long time, but we kind of isolated that in our personal lives. It absolutely 
um, affects our workplace behaviors. We spend a lot of time in the workplace and for us not to feel seen, heard, and feel that we belong in a place where we spend a lot of time, you know, people are going to leave. You're not going to stay somewhere you right. don't feel like you belong, as you know. Right. And so I know, Karen, you know, I talk a lot about the employee experience and you really isolated one key piece of that and focused your new work and research on that with hiring. You know, mm-hmm. I'm curious as you think, you know, a lot of companies come to me and say, hey, we're recruiting diverse groups of people or, you know, we're, maybe we're going yeah. to a different place or, you know, that's our initiative. Like it's not an initiative, it's a cultural shift, but good, good starting point. So recruiting to hiring to, you know, pay pro- and promotion decisions to how we manage performance to separation decisions to, you know, that the whole vast experience, you know, before we dig into hiring, which I know you're, you're an expert in, um, how do you see the employee experience being managed by the best of the best, you know, the, the best in class DNI um, focused organizations or professionals, what are they doing um, to drive a more inclusive employee experience? Yeah. So, oh my gosh. So, so many best practices out there. So much experimentation is happening. So much um, is being shared. I think it's though very early. I don't think we have yet the only formula, I'll call it. My, am I doing my fingers in air quotes and around formula? Um, <laughs> does it have to be a specific? Um, as specific as that. But I think that there's a lot of experimentation happening. Um, And we are only learning more and more. I'll give a case in point what I mean here. So for many years now, employee resource groups has been held up as a best practice. You should have an employee resource group for women, for people of color, for LGBTQ community members, and so on. And it's the kind of thing that that way a group can form, they can share concerns and challenges and advice and support each other. And that is wonderful. I absolutely love, in fact, back when I was at Adobe as a VP, I started our first women's ERG. Um, I'm a big fan of employee resource groups or ERGs, but now new research is coming out just last week, I believe, well, we'll call it in December of 2019, Mm -hmm. around, well, employee resource groups are good, but they're not serving people of color like they're serving the white people. Yep. So that's just one example of we are experimenting and learning. So I think it's um, a matter of sort of staying tuned uh, and following, or not following, but continuing to evolve whatever you're doing yourself at your company or whatever those um, best practices are that are in place. Never let resting on your laurels, always looking to see how you can do more. Um, and it can be as simple as asking if you're, if you're a manager or in some work team, you know, asking the people that you work with or work for you, it's like, what are two things I could be doing to make sure that you are doing your best work here? Mm-hmm. Simple. And look for fixing those things as well as like paying attention to engagement surveys or pulse survey scores and identifying things that are the pain points that you could fix. Yeah. Well, two things, two learning nuggets there. Yeah. Experiment, you know, get that feedback loop going. If it's not working, tweak, modify. And the second thing, I love the um, questions that a manager can ask. You know, a manager is really uh, controls a lot of that employee experience, right? So the middle manager inside an organization asking something powerful like that, like, you know, what are two things I could do to make sure that you feel you know, like you're your best self here at work or that you have the opportunity to do your best work. I mean, play around with the language that fits you and your personality Mm -hmm. Um, and employee engagement. You know, organizations have been measuring this forever, um, but they're not asking diversity and inclusion questions. Although I'm starting to see that a lot more to have a bank of, you know, a few questions up north of 10 or 12 questions that you can put inside your employee um, engagement survey and get some mm-hmm. good data that you can measure year to year to show traction. Are are the things that you're doing working or not working based on the perceptions of your employees? Right, right. Love that. And what you said too about it, the, you know, I'll call it the average person can be asking some questions to uh, get ideas of how they can better support and create more inclusion. Um, that is critical in my mind of why allyship is getting all this attention right now. I think it's because As you said, companies have been measuring inclusion or um, uh, engagement for years and years now, um, but the needle isn't really moving on their diversity numbers. So they know there's something wrong with inclusion. So they're still, they're experimenting, looking at big, you know, I'll call them top-down initiatives, big programs, but all it takes is one bad apple 
to spoil the bunch. It can take one, one leader, one manager, one employee who is incredibly toxic or just subtly toxic to the environment. They're the ones who are um, not inclusive. They're asking the wrong questions. They're saying off-color jokes. They are speaking over people. They're doing whatever. All it takes is that one person to ruin the experience of every employee in that group. Mm -hmm. yep. And that's why I think allyship, we have to empower people who are kind of on the ground, in the meetings, in the hallways, by the water cooler. We have to empower those people to be allies and to make a difference. Yeah. I was just with an organization today that had just that happen. And the leader of the organization has, has consumed all of her time uh, the last three weeks in managing the um, bad behavior of one person that certainly didn't represent the rest of the organization. So yeah, I mean, it can be quite a liability to have somebody speak um, out of out of turn that doesn't reflect the organization. And then the PR of, of that going out into um, our news cycle can be really negatively perceived and mislabeled on the organization. So, well, right you know, I know you and I come from a good place on this work. I want to believe, you know, we all want to be allies and it's just a matter of um, learning how to be more inclusive. There are some people that, that quite frankly do not get it. And um, you really need to be supplying tools proactively to make sure that that is managed proactively and that they are learning before it becomes um, a not so good event. Exactly. Love the way you raised all that tied it together. Yes. Well, um, without further ado, your new work. Uh, yeah. I've got some new work, drum roll. Um, yeah. And I know, I know it's a, at, the, at the point of this recording, it is a manuscript is being finalized. So our listeners yes. hopefully will have more information. But for now, tell us about your new work on inclusive hiring. You know, what will yes. the allies be with that? I know. So in my first book, Better Allies, there is a chapter on hiring. And I put together some best practices for how you can be inclusive about like what your career site looks like, what your job descriptions have in them, how, uh, the interview process, and so forth. And it's one chapter. And one of my professional colleagues and mentors and friends, when he, when he read the book, he's like, hey, Karen, that chapter on hiring that could be an entire book. And I kind of took that as a challenge um, and uh, spent some time this past year thinking about what would I add to that? What are the additional best practices out there? How can I expand it with more stories to make sure that people really are seeing the challenges, um, the cautionary tales around lack of inclusion, and what can happen when you are more inclusive. So I cover topics like I've already mentioned in terms of you know, your careers page. Um, what, what can that look like that is going to be not inclusive and kind of shut the door in people's faces and feel like, make them feel, I won't belong there. I'm not going to bother applying. So how can you make that more enticing? You know, where can you even um, start advertising your job that it maybe is different than you've been doing today to, to get a, cast a wider net and get more people knowing about what positions you have? Um, how can you be better with your job descriptions um, so that people aren't excluded from even applying, even if that's only in their mind. Um, and then, of course, the whole interview process, which is can make or break a candidate's experience if they do get it to that point. Um, so like my first book, Better Allies, this second book, it's called The Better Allies Approach to Hiring. Um, it is full of research, it's full of stories, and it's full of practical advice. Each chapter has a checklist of, okay, you've just read this whole chapter on you know, your job descriptions. Here's the checklist now to apply to your job descriptions the next time you write one, or if you've got some that are active, you want to go revise them. And likewise for each of the other chapters. Mm -hmm. So it's highly practical. Um, it is a short read. It is very, it's concise. It's to the point. Um, and um, the kind of thing that I hope will enable a lot of people to be rethinking their hiring approach mm -hmm. and being more inclusive. Um, because there are there are people, especially, um, I hear those stories from tech, but I know it happens other, other places too. There are people from these either underrepresented groups um, because of their gender or the, their race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, or they're underrepresented because they have a non-traditional career path or a non-traditional educational background. And they're out there and they're like, you know, kind of like, what's going on here? Here I am. I've got this experience. I know I can do that job. Why am I not even getting any callbacks? from 
from any of the you know hundreds of places I've been applying. And there is record low unemployment out there. I mean, <laughs> we are definitely here in the United States, but around the world, record low unemployment for skilled workers as well as non-skilled. But these skilled jobs, like we need to be not excluding people be from applying. We need to not exclude them from our initial phone screening or our processes for finding candidates. We need to be very welcoming to people from all sorts of different backgrounds who we might traditionally have not looked at mm-hmm. because I, so many of them can do the job just fine, if not knock it out of the park. Whoops. I am trying not to use sports <laughs> analogies. That was in my <laughs> newsletter a couple of weeks ago when I used one, knock it out of the park. Um, so I will correct myself, I'll say those employees really know they can get the job done and do it with, um, uh, in a stellar way. <laughs> oh, I know. There, those idioms are everywhere. Oh, and, yes. Uh, you, it, I love how you caught yourself. As an ally, it's okay. You're going to mess up. If we're waiting for everyone to be perfect, we will wait forever. So I love how you caught yourself in the moment and corrected it. It shows you're really intentional about what you're thinking. I try. I try, Julie. <laughs> well, I do it too. I mean, you and I spoke at a conference together a couple of years ago. And I remember you giving me feedback afterwards about the flip it to test. And I'm like, shame on me. You know, I got to own that. I was not doing due diligence on some of the things that I teach. So while we're all striving to be allies, we're all allies in training. <laughs> ah, yes, yes. I think oh, I that should be it. a new hashtag, allies in training. <laughs> Let's use it. <laughs> we are, yes, I love it. Um, and, and I love, Karen, how you also took the feedback from the book get, and continued to make practical tools for people because the hiring process is riddled with bias and everything from the job description to the interview questions to interview slates. I know you did a great job of, of covering kind of the key principles in your first book, Better Allies. So I can't wait to dig into to more detail here. It's certainly necessary for hiring managers that just, they don't know what they don't know and um, giving them practical tools and checklists they can, that can support them. Yes, yes. And at the end of the day, if they are really inclusive in their hiring process and they have an inclusive environment for those people to come in to, um, you can't have one without the other. It's not going to work. Um, but at the end of the day, word is going to get out. Word is going to get out about how just outstanding your environment is for inclusion. And people, you know, there are whisper networks out there. People will tell their friends, their colleagues, their um, online uh, followers, word will get out. And you're going to have a lot more people, amazing talent at your company. Yeah. And better business results too, or better Better. financial results, whatever that is for your organization. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, awesome, Karen. Well, we could talk for days. Um, (laughs) I'm so thankful to have had you share your expertise. And as an ally um, to me, I I just want to thank you for all the work you're doing. It's it's fantastic. And um, you're really a thought leader in the space. And I'm so thankful to know you. And, and likewise, Julie, I feel um, everything you've just said, flip it to test it right back at you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, let, let our listeners know what's the best way to get in touch and follow your work. Yeah, so betterallies.com has all the ways you can sign up for my newsletter, find out about my books, follow me on social media. It's also at Better Allies on Twitter, Instagram, Medium, Pinterest. Um, and then if um, people, you can always get in touch with me, there's a contact page. But then I also have more information about my speaking that I do and my workshops and my coaching practice at karencatlin.com. And do you have show notes? Can we put some links yeah, in the show yeah. notes? Yeah, we'll perfect. To all that and maybe the new forthcoming book too. Perfect. Yes. Awesome. Well, thank you, Karen. It's been such a pleasure to have you on. Thank you, Julie. Take care. Did you know that you can find all five seasons of our 50 plus episodes at nextpivotpoint.com and you can sign up for a complimentary seven day preview of our new program, Lead Like an Ally and order our new book, Lead Like an Ally. I appreciate you listening to this episode. Who do you know that needs to hear this message? Hit the share button and connect with me on LinkedIn. Simply search Julie Kratz, K-R-A-T-Z. I host this podcast because I believe we are stronger together. We are one.